The thing I'm going to talk about uh, now is uh, kind of an experiment or a research we did at JFrog uh, with our customers. Um, so it's this uh, view into DevOps bottlenecks. Basically, what we tried to do is to speak with customers and try uh, to figure out when they moved to DevOps. We tried to see what kind of bottlenecks they ran into and uh, how those bottlenecks uh, interfered in the way and how they changed the whole release lifecycle. Uh, Orit already made some uh, good build-up for me to speak about JFrog. You, you saw the, the list of, uh, of customers and, uh, and uh, the, the type of customers we have. So we have uh, customers from many, many different uh, sectors. Uh, um, we have many types of customers. So, so you, you uh, saw the big enterprises, but uh, we also have a lot of uh, startups. Uh, so when, when we spoke to our customers, we tried to get uh, a mixture of, uh, of both types. Uh, it ended up in us speaking uh, with a couple of dozens of our customers that moved to DevOps. Uh, and, and for us, it's kind of a natural thing because uh, I don't know how many of you are customers of JFOG, but we try to maintain uh, as much as we can, a very close and uh, interpersonal relation, relation with our customers uh, so in order to get uh, a lot of feedback and, and to make our products better. So that allowed us to select a couple of them and uh, really interview them and get their insights, uh, which uh, I'm going to bring here. And I'm going to put the spotlight on the issues. It's not necessarily that uh, there is always a solution, but uh, we will at least look at the spotlights. Uh, another thing is that we are dealing with binaries, and as such, uh, we are very focal into the development lifecycle. Who is using Artifactory here? Okay, pretty good. So, uh, so you probably know the, the, the main place that uh, a binary repository manager takes in the DevOps lifecycle, which makes uh, uh, JFOG uh, in a perfect position to, to talk about this stuff. So yeah, this is... Uh, or it already demonstrated it, it's the type of packages, some of them that we support, meaning that we uh, get to uh, see a lot of ecosystems as well. So let's start with DevOps. Uh, so just the word, it's a combination between devs and operations. Uh, if you look it up in Wikipedia, you will see that QA is also part of it. So the real definition from Wikipedia is that DevOps is there, this intersection between Development operations in QA, and I guess that dev QA ops didn't sound like a good word, so they decided to leave it out. But for us, it's uh, more of a, a holistic view. You cannot really do DevOps and you cannot really do automation partially. You have to have a, a merge of all the three. It's not an intersection and some parts are left on the side. It's just impossible to, to do it this way. So when, when we look at this uh, map of tools around, uh, you probably know this infinite loop of uh, the release lifecycle. Um, and the, the nice thing here is Koske talked about uh, Darwinism. So I'm sure that uh, I know for, for a fact that if uh, I would take this picture five years ago, uh, it will not look like this. And if I take this picture again five years ahead, we will see a lot of other players and many players that will just, uh, in this Darwinism, they will die out. Um, but the important thing for us is that we actually, when, when you have your binaries, you start right after the uh, plan and build phase. And you start to have your binaries and you start to move them all the way until you uh, end up in, uh, in production, deployment and operation. Meaning that uh, for JFrog, we get to, because we are hosting the binaries, we get to interact with many, many of these different tools uh, and ecosystems along the chain. So let's get to the meat of it. So the first thing we asked users is how long, so, and remember, those users are guys that already implemented DevOps. How long does it take for your release cycle uh, to take? How long it is? And we got very uh, uh, diverse answers. So ranging from six months to, uh, to even two hours. Uh, which makes you uh, really wonder why, why we get such a big uh, differentiation in the answers. We even have one guy that uh, joined Jeff Fogg from the US Army. And their release life cycle is two years. So it's 
kind of unheard of to create a new version every two years. Once it was practiced for any ISV, like a, a plan for, for one year or two years for, for releasing a new version. And those guys in the army, for, for sure, they are not implemented DevOps. You cannot do DevOps with such crazy uh, uh, release train. But still, we, we, it kind of left us, left us puzzled why we are seeing such a big differentiation. And, uh, okay, so I'm going to do a little survey here. So, so next thing we, we ask them is, are you happy with, your, uh, with how long it takes you to do a release? Are you happy with this uh, time of the release life cycle? So, quick show of hands, how many things that none of them are happy with what they have? So, uh, the answer is that 100% of them are happy. None of them is uh, dissatisfied with what they have. And the reason is that they kind of, they move to DevOps and they improve gradually. It happens along the process. Uh, people are not actively trying to make the release, the release cycle shorter. They pick some sort of a cadence and they stick to this cadence. They're, they're not trying to improve uh, in an artificial way, but it, they let the improvement happen along the way. And then we tried, out, tried to find what is the best release lifecycle and why we are seeing such a big difference. So uh, the, the real, when, when, it's, when we try to do the analysis and we try to map the customers that says uh, we are doing a release every uh, couple of hours and the ones that are telling us it takes us a, a couple of months, what we clearly saw is that the ones that are releasing faster are the ones that are having an online service rather than a software that the client needs to install. So the big difference is here is, is who controls the runtime, right? If you have a software which you have to, when you have to release a new version, you have to have your customer download and install it, it makes a whole, a whole lot of difference compared to an online service that you update, you often have just one or maybe two active versions at a time. You're in full control over how the, the migration is happening. You don't have to worry about customers jumping from one version to another version and you never know how they're going to, uh, to, take, to, to actually do the upgrades. And uh, uh, JFOG, for example, is, uh, is doing uh, both cloud and on-premise. And we, we have these problems. A lot of our uh, engineering efforts are um, dedicated to actually make sure that your upgrade is seamless. So, for example, what Jenkins is also kind of in this uh, uh, playground where they have to have users upgrade uh, rather than them, and, and it's really courageous what they're doing with Essentials, doing this uh, automatic uh, uh, flow. And the other thing is that there is a, a big, big difference between being able to do technical updates and to create new versions and actually doing it because uh, for, for many vendors, the, the version thing is a big thing. So we, we do a lot of kind of celebration around the version, especially major versions, right? So it's a, it's a marketing effort, it's a revenue effort. And uh, also if you tell customers, if you're not the one updating your customers, so when the update is seamless, um, it, it's very easy. But if you're asking your customers to upgrade more often than they, uh, they're actually willing to, you're kind of creating a, a mixed feeling among customers that they are missing out or that your previous release uh, uh, quality is not good enough, so you have to push new releases all, all the time, which is bullshit, but uh, this is what customers are actually feeling. What we saw uh, uh, with, with the customer that we interviewed is that the online guys, the ones that are providing a service, the, the slowest one was one week to create a new version. And um, the ones that are doing uh, on-premise installation, the fastest was two weeks. And even among those two weeks, uh, they, some of them, they are, they are ready in two weeks. They have an internal version ready, but they will do an update once a month because two weeks is, uh, is, is, is too much. And JFOG, by the way, is, uh, is closer to two weeks. And sometimes we, we see this, uh, this uh, uh, customer uh, fear of uh, why are you pushing a new update on us? We just upgraded. So, 
And uh, by the way, m many of the things uh, that I'm speaking about, this version ID and continuous updates, are, are, uh, we, we wrote about them in this uh, book that Orit mentioned. So it's a shameless plug, but uh, it's, it's a really fascinating topic, uh, at least for me. And then we tried to, uh, we went ahead and we asked users, how do you know that your release cycle is good? Okay. And we got all kind of uh, answers. Uh, most of them are not really scientific, but uh, they were common. So I, I, nobody complained, so I, I don't measure it. Uh, my bug queue is empty, so must be good. And I don't get uh, a lot of tickets in the process, so uh, yeah. I automated every single step of the update, so I must have done the right thing. And we got all kind of uh, uh, fluffy answers, like uh, I have a good version adoption for my new releases, uh, my bug down, my bug uh, uh, burnout uh, diagram is, is, is free, um, mean time to recovery is short, and uh, uh, it used to take me two, uh, two days, now it's uh, two minutes, so I must have done the right thing. And the other thing is, is business metrics. So this is really important, guys. We are living in an era where the actual bosses, the actual CEOs, are very, very aware of the contribution of software to the actual business. And this is very new. Uh, it was not like that uh, five or six years ago. And this is uh, like uh, the, the biggest uh, analyst uh, uh, survey by Gartner telling us that CEOs, they see the software as a main component and a main part of the revenue that the company is making. So they're actually measuring you guys and they're measuring when you're doing DevOps, when you start, nobody is going to care if you did 1% improvement or 23% improvement. But once you, you made it uh, the business of your organization to do DevOps, you are being measured and you have to show that you're going forward and you're not pulling the company in, in the wrong direction. So this is why there are tools in the market today that are focused around measuring this stuff. So uh, CloudBiz DevOptics and JFOG Insight, and th there are many other tools that are trying to see and, and provide metrics around this uh, ecosystem and around the pipeline to see that you're moving forward. Given all these questions, we try to find out wh where these bottlenecks are, are actually happening. So when, when we talk about DevOps, we usually talk about this combination of, uh, of uh, education and automation and trust, and we try to break it out between the, those three main pillars. And talking about education, so we often say that pain is instructional, meaning that when we are, we are improving, we are improving because we are suffering. So we are starting to feel some kind of pain. To make the improvement uh, and, and to make pain teach you something, so first you need to, you need to know, you need to realize that something is painful. And we know that sometimes we don't fix anything until we realize it's broken. Uh, then you need to believe that you can make the change. So for example, these guys from the US Army, they, they know that they have a very slow and, uh, um, and problematic release lifecycle, but they don't believe they can do any change because they are subject to many regulations, they have policies that are there for years and they're not going to try and, and uh, make an internal uh, uh, revolution inside the army trying to, to break this stuff, so they kind of give up from the beginning. And finally, you need to, uh, to care, right? So you need to make sure that uh, the changes are, 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 are actually happening and not ignore them. And usually when you try, uh, it's very hard to push, but when we spoke to customers, none of them was uh, regretting doing this uh, this move to, to DevOps, even though it was out in a large code base and DevOps is all around uh, automation and, and writing software. So in a large uh, uh, code base, it, take, it can take you a year or, or more just to make this change happen. So what is holding you back in making this change? So first, it's, it doesn't come as a surprise, it's, it's financials. It takes money, it takes resources. And this is why you have uh, DevOps me measurement tools uh, to make sure that you can, you can justify the money that you're spending on making the change. The other thing is uh, this belief that if you're doing automation, you're going to end up uh, with people losing their jobs, 
right? So the, I think the biggest uh, place where this happens is, is QA. So people are telling you that uh, if you're moving to uh, an absolute automated QA, you will end up with a lot of QA guys losing their job and, uh, and uh, uh, staying, uh, getting unemployed. But we know for a fact that this is not true. So it's, it's basically fake news. And uh, if, uh, if I ask any one of you that is managing people uh, and managing uh, developers, if he has too much uh, of, uh, of an offering of uh, automated QA guys, I'm sure everyone will, will agree that uh, those guys are scarce and they're hard to find. So uh, what, what happens really is that there is no unemployment, just people have to shift. So some people will adjust and some people will in fact lose their jobs because they cannot adjust. adjust. But uh, automation actually creates a demand for, for a whole new type of jobs. And we see that uh, uh, in the Jeff Hogar and the, uh, every time that we're making a change. And automated QA is one example. Regarding automation, uh, so to, to make things automated, to deal with, uh, with complexity, we need tools that allow us to, to make this change. And we try to see what customers are doing in terms of tools. Of course, we know that they're using uh, the Jeff Hogg stack, but we wanted to see how they actually choose their tools and what they tell other developers. And, and you will see in a minute that when I'm saying customers, we're, we are speaking about customers that are far beyond the uh, a few hundreds people and, and so on in, in an organization. So I'm going to first throw a couple of uh, rules at you. The first one is a, a, a law called Augustine's law. So basically it means that software is getting complex all the time. Okay, it's getting more hard uh, to maintain. It's uh, the cost of software it keeps uh, um, increasing. And basically, uh, we're dealing with ever-growing complexity when we're developing software. We know that software rots and software is becoming harder to maintain, but um, there's, there's some guy that actually made the law for this. And what we're seeing here is a very, very strong trend we're seeing. So this means that uh, what we're actually seeing here is that uh, when we have uh, the DevOps team that are serving your developers, serving the organization, uh, and when we start to get more developers, the number of DevOps doesn't scale up the same way that developers scale up. It's, it cannot scale uh, uh, infinitely like, uh, like you can almost scale developers and onboard new projects. Uh, we, call it, we call it super DevOps, and uh, the ratios we see here is we will see a super DevOps team of uh, 15, 30 people and, uh, that are serving uh, 30, 50,000 developers in, in many organizations that are uh, large organizations. This is the ratio. And most of them, they are even not uh, distributed. It's a team that sits uh, uh, in the same time zone. Sometimes they will have some guys uh, uh, in different time zones, so they don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to resolve very simple things. But for the most part, they are uh, co-located. And these guys, they need very good tools that have good APIs and good automation. So uh, uh, Jenkins and Kubernetes and, and, uh, and Artifactory that allow them to, to scale and to cut down permissions to different teams and to build solutions that are very highly reliable so that they can serve this uh, amount of developers. Another uh, law that I think is more uh, common is Conway's law. Anyone know? about Conway's law? Okay, a few people, because it, it's a more common rule, and this rule says that uh, when you look at a product, software in our case, uh, it reflects your, organ your org chart. So we, we kind of know this feeling when you go into a product and you start navigating the UI, and all of a sudden you see that there are two places where you can apply the same changes. Maybe they, one of them gives you less options and the other has options that the first one doesn't. And what this me usually means is that there is duplication and the teams that are creating the product are not speaking with each other and the communication is broken. So when we are talking about DevOps and applying DevOps to tools in a big organization, you have to break this Conan's law. Uh, Conway's, Conway's law. Conan is another thing. 
And this is another thing that we, that we uh, see very clearly, is that most of organi organizations, to break the Conway's law, they don't dictate a solution. They will do some, something in turn, like the, if you know the ThoughtWorks technology radar, they have their own recommendations in-house, so they tell people, this is the stack that, you, that we support, this is what uh, uh, we give you out of the box, this, this is what you can use. If you want to use something else, go ahead, do it, but don't come running to us when things are breaking because we will not support you. So this is the way to, to actually force users to um, have less duplication and less fragmentation of tools in, in a DevOps organization. Finally, I want to uh, speak about the last thing, uh, the last pillar, which is trust. Or, or why trust is a bottleneck, so I will let you watch it for a second. So I hope it's staged. Somebody gets in with a tray of coffee and trust is broken. Uh, I don't know if you know this slide. It's, uh, it's uh, from social uh, uh, studies. It's, the, it's basically uh, the five elements of a team that is not functioning. And the base of, uh, of the, the lack, of, lack of trust is the base of a team that doesn't function. So basically when we are trying to do DevOps and we, we are failing with it, a lot of time it's our trust in, in the process. And there are certain type of uh, trust. So the first uh, mistrust is uh, in software quality. So we have automated testing uh, and we, we, have, uh, we may have very good coverage of our software. But then what we're seeing a lot of times, uh, actually in all of the, the Jeffro customers that we interviewed, is that when you need to push to production, you never ever let the developer do it. Uh, so you always have somebody to, that has to push the green button. You, even though everything is fully automated, you don't let developers commit and go straight to production. I know that some organizations claim that they do it. I'm sorry guys, we didn't see it. It's a real practice and there are thousands of uh, of, uh, uh, of cases like that. Um, so, and, and there are actually a lot of tools that, there are like vaults and, and all kind of uh, tools that are uh, around making sure the developers don't have the secrets to production and don't have access to production, that kind of breaks this uh, automation cycle uh, and, and make sure that production is, is not uh, consumed by developers. So, other, some ways to deal with it is to do uh, uh, to, to make users test your software. So we, we know about canary releases, uh, and canary releases they are good in places where first uh, you have a lot of users. So even if you wanted to do some testing, there is no way uh, for Google, for example, to create a staging environment uh, for Gmail. Right? It doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't happen. Also, some features, you cannot make them canary because uh, if you make your users lose money or if you're, hurt, if you're hurting their business, uh, which is another f so a way of uh, saying we make them lose money, uh, people will, will be pissed at you. And um, also, when you do such a change, you're, you're hurting a very small fraction of users in a way that, will, that are not is not impacting them. Uh, uh, maybe they will have a UI glitch and they will refresh and they will get to a new server and nobody's going to start saying that your product sucks because you're doing a canary release. So this is some privilege that the, the big guys have. Smaller companies like uh, that are doing changes in products that are not or, or websites that are not impacting uh, immediately the, the user experience. For example, we spoke with HashiCorp that told us that uh, they're doing, a, they roll out 20% of the change and they actually watch the Twitter for two hours to see if people are starting to complain and, uh, and then they, they roll out the rest. So this is a, a privilege that uh, not all of us has. Another point is uh, lack of trust in security. So this is a very big thing and also uh, something that is recent. Uh, something that was there so strong a few years back. Uh, anyone knows what this picture is? So it says NYC link. So basically this is the New York City uh, effort to replace payphones. Um, even though payphones, I, I don't know anyone that is actually dialing for payphone today. 
but uh, it's a kiosk, it's, run, it, it's running on Android. Uh, there are thousands of machines like that scattered in the New York City uh, business district. Um, it's kind of cool, it's not the, uh, I, I saw uh, that Australia is also doing the same thing uh, with JC the Cow, they, they have this kiosk, uh, it has Wi-Fi, or it spoke about the battery anxiety, you can charge your phone, you can get connectivity, uh, you, can, you can surf, of course it displays ad, it has a uh, tamper safe uh, mechanism, so if you start to shake it, it will call out to a, to a central center and the cups will get there. Uh, so it's a pretty cool system in New York, and they have extra batteries to deal with hurricanes and so on. Uh, but also it's a, it's a big, uh, it's basically a big network of computers. And uh, so I was, uh, uh, I was in New York with my wife and I took this picture, and she looked at me like I'm a little uh, off. And then I saw one of them one morning, one of them booted, and I took this picture too, so... And then she really looked at me like, yeah, I'm, I'm sick. Uh, and what, what you, you may think, it's all very cool, but at the end of the day, there is a big attack factor here, right? The upgrade mechanism of those uh, devices, if you get a hold on how you upgrade the software on these devices, you have like a swarm of thousands of, of uh, Android devices uh, at your disposal, and you can, uh, you can use it in, in all sorts of ways. Another thing just to demonstrate this big fear around security that we're starting to have, this is a, a 2017 survey uh, on the Docker Hub. So this was the number of official images. I'm not sure what an official Docker image is, but uh, apparently there is some process that is uh, not very effective to, to make an image uh, uh, official. Because we see that, uh, first of all, uh, around something like 2% of the images there are using the latest tag, even though they are official. Meaning that you, if you, depending on the point in time that you will do a pull, you will get a completely different version of the image. Uh, the number of, uh, the median number of vulnerabilities, of security vulnerabilities, uh, 100, uh, 127 vulnerabilities, uh, roughly on those images. And none of these images is free of uh, vulnerabilities. So you may think, oh, okay, it's, uh, it's security and uh, vulnerability is just a form of, uh, of a software bug and there is no software with no bugs, but it really leads to, to a, a risky point of, uh, of uh, security fatigue. You're saying, okay, we, we live with the security vulnerabilities, but it, it doesn't really work like that. Most of the companies, even uh, small startups, are totally obsessed with security today. And uh, the, the ones with deep pockets are scared for uh, their money, the ones that uh, our startups are scared for their reputation. Uh, and we know for a fact that uh, security is, the, the, fact, the way that people are taking it, uh, advantage of software is starting to change. We have NPM and Docker package, uh, packages that are uh, doing Bitcoin uh, mining uh, without you knowing it. People are using all kinds of social techniques, like uh, type squatting, when you do a, an NPM install or a Ruby install of a very common package and you switch the letters, uh, or you make a typo. Uh, so people will deploy packages and the package managers, they have to be aware of this risk because it's a real uh, risk. Um, and and the, the, the point is that everyone wants a clean runtime. So when you're doing DevOps, if you don't make security part of automation, uh, you, can, you cannot actually uh, achieve success in that. So finally, at the end of the day, when you're automating something, it's all uh, a question of control, right? Uh, when you're doing things in a small scale, the, it's, it's very easy to control. When you're implementing DevOps, especially in large organizations, when you're serving tens of thousands of customers, or internal customers, it's very hard without proper tooling and it's very hard without uh, proper discipline. And uh, I showed some of, the, some of the issues. Some of those issues are, are, are fake. They are not real issues. Some of them uh, uh, can be easily solved. Some of them will be solved with uh, new tools and new techniques that, that are just uh, popping out. Uh, so I hope uh, I gave you some food for thought uh, and uh, you found it interesting. And that's it for me. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>